This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. I was trying to get an idea. I want them dead presidents. I want to pull up. Head spin. Get it, get flat. I got six jobs. I don't get it. And we are still, still, still not tired on this week's episode of Two Bad Hombres. I am your host, Vito Eranimo Churko, along to my usual sidekick and broadcast partner and fun. That is Doc from Doc and Jack, John Charles Macaroon. John, how are you doing? Vito, is it safe to say that the biggest loser of the week was the media? Oh, God. Going you, you know, right to it. No, we're going to talk about it later in the podcast. Uh, obviously, the Mueller report came out. And it vindicated Donald Trump for the time being. For the time being. It's not completely exonerated. Anyways, let's yes. move on, right? Yeah, we'll talk about it. because he can it spin also... it any way that he wants. He's not completely exonerated. It Sorry, a... Don. Well, Vito, see... You're like, the, hey, you come at me. I'm going to say... It's the truth, though, right? Vito, hey, here's not the that thing. we're going to get into it here, but that's, the, that's what I think. This will be the crux of our debate, is that everybody's looking at facts and still saying stupid things like, oh, well, he's still not exonerated. Well, he's guess not. what? He can say as long he can say all day long in his sleep. He's probably dreaming about it being exonerated. He probably gets off to it. No, he's he not exonerated. He's no, not. He is exonerated. Read the there Mueller was report. no collusion. He the did Mueller not report collude. has not been completely revealed. Remember, it hasn't. That Will Barr, the Attorney General, has decided not to release it completely yet. The Democrats want it released. Are we really going to get into it here? I mean, that's the truth. That is the truth. So we'll see what happens. Boy, Vito, uh, we'll see what happens. My did man. Donald Trump work with Russians to cause problems in the election? Time out. There was still some kind of Russian interference. Not that he were. I'm not saying that he worked. Had direct ties. Yes. Oh, there has been things okay. where he has been okay. exonerated. I said completely exonerated. He has not been. Remember that. Okay. And everybody around him in his front circle, inner circle, has been indicted on something. He's dealing with crooks still. Uh, you have a crook as a president behind the scenes. Now his hands aren't in the cookie jar and getting caught. So he's not uh, committing maybe illegal activities himself and going to be thrown into jail. But he's got crooks as friends. A lot of crooks, man. He ain't no saint. Okay. Just say it. Whether or not you're on the right side or the wrong side of the argument, the, the, the good thing that's happening and more people are starting to realize, oh, okay, I got to do a little bit more critical thinking. You know how much uh, blame I assigned to the president? Zero throughout this whole thing. None of the information that was presented on any side I looked at because, and we'll get to it at the time of the argument, the way in which the media is presenting information is turning people off. And that's the crux of the argument. You know, we could talk about specifics, but the media has done a bad job and the trust level as we sit today is even lower than when it was when we started this podcast. But I want to start this podcast on a lighter note because obviously I want to make it about me. And Oh, good. And, 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 don't and, we do that every single recording of Two Bad Hombres? <laughs> Shh. Don't tell anybody. Yeah, let's not tell anybody too much about that, right? So, you know, in my subdivision, you know, in Macomb County, it's fairly nice. A lot of upscale people, a uh, great family town. Uh, you've been to my home. It's lovely. It's I fair. Have. It's nice. Nice enough. It does a job for me, right? It does a job. It's a lovely yes. subdivision, right? So I act freely. I, I do whatever I got to do. And sometimes, you know, when I'm in a rush or I got things to do, obviously with multiple businesses, you know, doing a podcast with you and taking care of so many things, I go through that subdivision and I'm racing like, you know, the speed limit's 25 and I'm going 40 miles an hour. And so people are starting to look at me funny and they're starting to go, okay, well, Three years ago, my wife, she joined up for the subdivision Facebook group. And, you know, from time to time, we would peek into the debates that people would have with each other, like, hey, you're not cutting your grass and this and that. And, and, and the neighbors would argue with each other. So I would peek into it and kind of pay attention to what people were talking about and what they were involved in. Well, this December, I'm like, fine, you know what? Let me be a part of something. So I joined the group. OK, so now I get emails every time someone posts to that group. Well, do you know what people are posting now? People are posting pictures of cars and going, hey, look out for this Jeep. They were driving 40 miles an hour down our street. And it's being used as a way to kind of track people and to keep people safe. And I'm looking at it like, oh, my God, they haven't gotten me yet, Vito. But my wife is like, John, you got to be careful because they're snapping photos. They're talking about people. They're, you know, putting people's dirty laundry. And so this is a case of Big Brother eyeing me. And I don't like it because, you know what? Not everybody, you know, speeds, and yes, speed is, is important in terms of the kids and things like that, but if you pay attention, you can reasonably drive 35 in a subdivision. 25 is too slow, and I'll be honest, I don't really, you know, 
follow that too often. Yeah, what do you drive then? You said 35 and up? 32, 33. And when you say 32 or 33, is it really 35? Uh, sometimes, most of the time, you know, I'm driving okay. fast in the sub. Well, now and, you're being honest, at least. Yeah, and so I just don't like the fact that th- there are people that are, like, spying and taking photos like, you know what, here's what you got to do. Mind your own business, go back in your house, sit in your garage, have a beer, and stop tattling. Look, you know, if you want to stop the problem, maybe you make a phone call to the police and you ticket people that are speeding. But I've never gotten a ticket in that sub. The police are never in that sub. So to have the citizens independently do it on Facebook, I think is corny. I think is ridiculous. And I find that here's what else people are doing and posting. They post, you know, hey, you know, the good stuff like, hey, is there a roofer you recommend, a plumber, you know, da-da-da. But also there was this beef that went on in the sub that was classic where two neighbors who lived next to each other, okay, Vito, two people who lived literally next to each other were going on Facebook and going, hey, you're not uh, taking care of your lawn. And one guy's like, well, I'm busy and da 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 and, uh, you know, we've gone through some things and you know we've talked about this. And, and they're going back and forth, back and forth, and they're fighting and they live next to each other. And so finally, you know, my wife brought me in and I'm looking at it uh, all on Facebook. Finally, they actually solved it themselves on Facebook. You know what? Can my son come over to your house every week and... Uh, Cut it, and I'll give you this much money? Okay, fine. But they went through it, all this stuff, airing it out in public. So for me, I think subdivision Facebook groups, and really Facebook groups in general, besides our podcast one that I formed, is pretty corny. I don't like it at all. And am I wrong? Should you know subdivisions police themselves and air people's business and what they're doing on a public platform so that everyone in the sub can know that um, the best post video, if that comes out, Let's pay attention to this white cruise. They're driving 42 down. Uh, I would song. love to see that, man. You <laughs> just get outed. I've, th- I've, I've thought about going in there and being like, come on, guys. Is this really important? There's so much other stuff you could do. Drinking, podcasting, going out watching sports. You really go to Facebook, go to hit groups, and then air people's dirty laundry, take photos of the cars and, and air out what people are doing. I just find that to be the height of ridiculousness on every level. By the way, we have a podcast group. You started a podcast group. Am I a part of it? Am I actually in the group? Are you in the group, you know? And I'm in L. Oh, I'll add you to it. It's, uh, uh, it's I called care less. It's, called, it's like uh, we just talked about this neighborhood group. I don't want to be a part of a group. Right. I don't know everybody in that group. No, I know you. I can deal with you when I'm in the studio. And I can talk to you via text, over the phone, here in studio. I don't need a group with you. Okay, this is good enough. You and I, one-on-one. But I really didn't even know that. Maybe I did, but at one point. Anyways, about your neighborhood group. You know what? People have the right to their public outcry and releasing all their dirty laundry on Facebook. Yet, I feel like at times, why not if your neighbors go and deal with it in person? How about the interpersonal relationships and connections that we're supposed to make as human beings and to deal with issues, to resolve issues? Why can't we do that and get things resolved that way, Doc? I mean, it's almost a lost art, right? And I'm not going to say I'm like this uh, conflict resolution dude now that should be the go-to conflict resolution dude, but isn't there something about dealing with and resolving conflicts in person as well? Have you ever been a subject of a Facebook post that someone made about you but didn't tag you in it, or they were obviously talking about you, and you saw it going, people debating and laughing or joking around, and you knew it was about you? Yeah, who is that sexy little person on Delta Street? In Clinton Township. I knew right away that was me. Nice. No, no, that never happened. I wish. Actually, I'll say this really quick, though. When I lived in Berkeley, okay, during college, I was the subject, not of a post, but of a photo that was taken of me and somebody that cited me walking outside in my underwear, but like briefs. I was walking outside on the phone, talking on the phone, and I was cited. Somebody said they saw me, and then uh, it was true, and then my buddy... One of them in my house that I roomed with took a photo of me walking outside on the phone on the sidewalk. So I was outed there. Now, a neighborhood group or people coming at me and outing me for something that was bad that I did, I mean, I guess if that was bad, and I guess I could have been arrested for what? I don't know. You tell me. But I've gone that far and done that and had the audacity to walk outside in my underwear, which were like briefs, by the way, too. So everything was covered, okay? Covered really well. But... I've never been truly the subject of a post online on social media, which, hey, if we get bigger and bigger, we might be, right? And I guess we've had people attack us on Twitter, but not via like a Facebook group page. Now, here's the thing, too, though. Uh, I understand why people do it. It's the shaming notion. Like, hey, if we out you for doing it. Then you'll stop doing it, right? I get the notion, but here's the thing. Some people might take offense to that and get really angry and things like that. And, And not that many people, I think, in the subdivision are actually part of it. So 
really, you're just complaining to like-minded people. But the problem is getting worse because every day people are posting about it, people speeding and things like that. So, you know, Vito, if I had to pay $200 for driving eight miles an hour over the speed limit, I'd stop. 100%. I'd stop the first time and uh, it would get me to. But I guess I could slow down a little bit and pay attention uh, because there are a lot of kids in the sub. But they're, they're smart kids. They get out of the way. They know the big white cruise is coming in. You better... Uh, uh, big white cruise. Be afraid of that, right? <laughs> be afraid of the big white cruise. Well, Vito, you know what else I'm afraid of? Nolan Finley and hopefully not ever getting editorialized by him. Now, for those that don't know, Nolan Finley is a writer at the Detroit News. And what he wrote kind of sparked off a big, huge debate online last week. And it was in regards to Tom Izzo, which we talked about uh, on various platforms and podcasts here at the network. But he comes out and he writes an editorial. So it's his opinion. And he comes down hard on Tom Izzo and Michigan State, basically uh, categorizing Tom Izzo and Michigan State as enabling a man that could be a guy that's as dangerous as Larry Nasser. And so for me, I totally disagreed with that article. I disagreed with the way in which he tied Tom Izzo to Larry Nasser. Now, look, you can be against Tom Izzo and him being demonstrative, but what I don't like is when people start doing the, well, what if game. And that's where I think we're going down this rabbit hole that's a problem. Tom Izzo has never put his hands on an athlete, has never been charged with anything bad, but what Nolan Finley tried to do was to say, well, based on this behavior, you know, this could have been right up there with something that Bob Knight did. Well, Bob Knight actually put his hand on a player on tape that got him fired. So it has sparked a nationwide debate. And I understand the debate, you know, in terms of should coaches get angry? Should coaches display demonstrative natures, uh, you know, in, in, in big time moments and things like that? I get the debate. But I feel like Tom Izzo was treated unfairly because this is something that has gone on. And in the end, you know, Michigan State, the administration, the country has seen him do this now for 20 years. And now you're going to change your mind? The players don't have a problem with it, so why do other people? And that's my issue with the, with the notion of, you know, this whole outcry that happened over Tom Izzo is that, you know, yes, I understand that there needs to be oversight, but there is. The NCAA has investigated Michigan State. They found, guess what they found, Vito? Nothing. But here's the problem, and it'll actually tie into our talk regarding the media. A piece of information comes out. And people start weighing in and giving opinions on that, irregardless of the fact that it's ongoing. Okay? They say, oh, Michigan State is being investigated by the NCAA for past allegations. Oh, Michigan State's hiding things. Michigan State. People are right now in the biggest problem that we're having, and maybe you might see this too, is people are assuming that people are guilty before due process. It's in this country, I think we should get back to. Innocent until proven guilty. And right now in the 24-hour news cycle and the way things are, are coming out, it's like, he's guilty. He's a bad guy. He's done this. He's like Bob Knight. He's guilty. When you go, whoa, take a step back here. Tom Izzo screams like that on a Wednesday, you know, versus Nebraska. He gets in people's faces. And in the NCAA tournament, the stakes are larger. So Aaron Henry understood it. The team understood it. But here's why people are upset. They go, oh, my gosh, is Tom Izzo left unchecked? Does he need to be held accountable? Could he actually, based on this behavior, uh, abuse a kid? Well, Vito, I'll say this, okay? Could he do it in the future? Yes, it could happen. Is talking about it now ever going to prevent it? No, okay? So here's the notion, okay? You can't predict future behaviors and future crimes. Yes, you can judge and discuss if you think that his way of coaching is not the best for the kids, but guess what? He's going to do it, and he's going to do it that way until he retires. It's a form of coaching. It's one in which that is allowed. You can yell at kids. Now, in this day and age, is it a bad look? Yeah. Do people like to see it? No. More and more people are turned off by it. But those people that are turned off by it uh, don't know the man or they don't understand why he's doing it. So for Nolan Finley to tie into Larry Nasser, I think part of the reason why there's mistrust in the media is I think he, he sat down and said, okay, that's partly my opinion, but how do I add to it? How do I make it uh, an opinion that people are going to talk about? And he added this to it because Tom Izzo is the furthest thing from Larry Nasser. He is. It's a fact. Uh, this is a man that helps kids get to the NBA. He is running a clean program, and he's doing things well. So you could say, you know, Tom Izzo could be a better coach. He could handle things better. But to say that he's walking up to the line and is on the verge of abusing a kid, I think it was a little bit of an outcry. It's stretching, it. stretching yeah. it. 
to have Tom Izzo's name attached to Larry Nassar's name, too, is faulty in itself. You're really stretching it. And you're reaching, and then you're blurring opinion with fact. But now, you're a journalist, uh-huh. so you, I'm sure you saw the article and read it. It wasn't that long, so it was easy to go through, and he made his points, and people uh, in the media blasted him. We're saying, this is, a, this is garbage. This isn't good. As a journalist, okay, I understand why he did it. He got attention. We're talking about it. Should people editorialize like this? Would you teach, if you're a professor at UDM, and I walk into your class and I go, I want to be Nolan Finley. I want to be well, that I would guy. I say to you, why are you here? Please move. <laughs> get out of here really quick. You're not qualified. Yeah, you're not qualified for this. You're like, Trust no, me. You're like, nobody paid me $5 million to get you here. And I would say, how old are you? <laughs> By the way, uh, you're too old for this. Adios. Did the Detroit News take a hit from allowing this to be printed? I think PR-wise, yes. The Detroit News has taken a hit. I think it's uh, an ugly mark on the news' image. Because Nolan Finley to write this without any fact, fact-based evidence to back up his claim that this could lead to abuse in the future, him putting his article. hands on the neck of Bob Knight, or like Bob Knight did, that's not right. And it's an opinion. It's an editorial, remember. Opinion is not fact. But now these writers more and more, and maybe because of the instant reactions that social media provides in this day and age of the 24-7 news cycle, but you see these opinionists that now are being viewed as these fact-based guys that are writing pieces that are based on fact-based evidence. Yet, an editorial, guys, to all of you out there that don't know enough about it, an editorial means that's his opinion. So it can't be faulty. He has a right to write that article and to speculate that something that Tom Izzo did in the first round game against Bradley with his berating of Aaron Henry could lead to Izzo one day putting his arms, his hands, on a kid in practice, at a game, off the court. Yet it's a stretch for Nolan Finley to take it that far to allege that Tom Izzo has that in him to where he could cross the line one day and place his hand slash hands on a kid in practice, at a game, away from the court. Well, it's still stretching it, and it's giving Tom Izzo a bad name when he doesn't deserve it. He's been great to these kids over the years. And guess what? He's known for delivering tough love, right? Messages of tough love. He's going to get in your face, berate you at times verbally. And guess what? These players have to deal with it. And they have over the years. And many came to back him up. Draymond Green, all these other dudes defended him and his ways. So these players have known over the years, hey, this is what Coach Izzo is all about. He's going to give it to me, man. Get in my face and let me hear about it. When I make a mistake, and these players that sign on the dotted line to join Michigan State hoops nowadays, too, know going into it that this is what I'm signing up for. When I become a part of the Michigan State men's basketball program, I'm going to have to deal with this side of Tom Izzo at times, the side where he's going to deliver to me some tough love, get into my face, perhaps berate me, perhaps border the line and almost cross it, if not cross it. But this is all verbal. Coaches have done this for 40, 50, hundreds of years, thousands of years, right? It's almost in the very makeup of coaches is this side to coaches where they get on you, right? And Tom Izzo at this point in his long-tenured coaching career is not going to change his ways, nor should he have to. So violation on the Detroit News for something like this. To publish this is faulty of them. And it paints a negative image of the news, which I know we live in the day and age of clickbait or getting clicks, right, for your articles. But you writing this, allowing this piece to be written for that purpose, it's not a good look for the Detroit News. Yeah, it's trying to shape people's opinion in a way that uses hyperbole, that uses something that is actually toxic in sexual abuse versus somebody that is yelling at a kid in a coaching environment. Yeah. And not placing his hands on that kid, by the way, too, as we already said. So before we take a commercial break and uh, show love to our sponsors, um, do you think Tom Izzo can be Tom Izzo going forward? Can he coach that way? Uh, will that be actually legislated out of the game? Because we're moving in that direction. More people want, obviously, less public displays of anger you know, displayed toward kids. Do you think he can do that going forward, 2020, 2021? Will eventually it catch up to him, just the very nature of the PC world that we live in, that you just can't act that way anymore? Well, to push a legislation or a rule in the NCAA to disallow this moving forward, it means the end of Tom Izzo's coaching days. He'll resign. Coach K will resign. Roy Williams will resign. John Calipari will resign. In football, Nick Saban, Dabo Sweeney, 
all these other dudes too. Urban Meyer would have retired a long time ago. There'd be no chance of him rejoining the coaching ranks. So I think to get rid of this completely, it's not going to happen because these coaches are known for that. That's what makes them tick. It's what makes them into great headmen. It really does in their respective sports. So Tom Izzo, to get him to change his ways and to make him not get upset at times when he sees his players blatantly making mistakes that are rectifiable, he's not going to change. He's going to get in your face still. And I think for the NCAA or somebody else, some other organization to go in there and try to slap these coaches on the wrist or, or get rid of this coaching tactic, it's never going to be gotten rid of completely. It's always going to be a part of the game. And these people that don't like it in this PC climate that we live in today, Doc, are just going to have to suck it up and continue to deal with it or stop watching the game of basketball. Stop watching the game of football because it has long existed in these respective sports and it's going to continue to exist as well. I want to thank the sponsors of this broadcast, Detroit City Sports, and I want to thank the Legacy Football Organization. Now Vito's going to tell us more about them. Great sponsors of the network. So our newest sponsor is DC Sports. Follow Detroit City Sports online at DetroitCitySports.com. And its location is at Lakeside Mall. And happening today is an autograph session being conducted by former Red Wings player, Darren McCarty. So go there today at Lakeside Mall starting at 1 p.m. at DC Sports to go and meet and get an autograph signed from Darren McCarty. And then we have Legacy Football, our other fine sponsor of Two Bad Hombres. And remember, Legacy Football was founded in 2009. It is a premier destination for off-the-field development in education, in social awareness, and in football. And to find out more about Legacy Football and all of the events that they are hosting at its beautiful complex, the Legacy Center in Brighton, Michigan, please contact National Director of Football Ops, Justin Sassante, or go online today to LegacyFootballOrg.com. Thanks again, everybody, for downloading the latest edition of Two Bad Hombres. It airs every Saturday on the network. I'm looking forward to this discussion regarding the media with Vito, but uh, let's start with and frame it this way. Uh, earlier in the week, it was announced that Michael Avenetti, the former lawyer of uh, Stormy Daniels, he was charged with trying to extort up to $25 million from Nike. Now, he's come out on the offense since then, later in the week, I believe on Tuesday, he said, I'm going to release some information, and it's going to rock college basketball. And what he described in his tweets, uh, you can follow him on Twitter, uh, Michael Avenetti, and you can find that he says that Nike has been complicit in paying college athletes and that people all the way to the top knew about it. Now, here's where it gets interesting, too, in that uh, the Wall Street Journal, I believe, names a co-conspirator it hasn't been officially said yet, but they're kind of hinting that it's Mark Garagos. Mark Garagos is a celebrity lawyer, a former CNN contributor who I love uh, listening to every single week with uh, Adam Carolla. And he actually talks about uh, the law and he talks about how the media jumps to conclusions and things like that. And when he jumped on the Jesse Smollett case, he said, when the news breaks and the facts come out, I think there's going to be a strong chance that it's going to go in a way that's going to be good for Jesse. And guess what happened? Well, earlier in the week, he was cleared, wiped out. So this guy, Mark Garagos, handles his business, and he's involved in a lot of things. And he's aware of kind of how things go. But I'm not going to rush to judgment in this situation with Michael Avenetti and Mark Garagos. Because here's the part that would be kind of weird to look at, okay? Let's look at common sense. Now, it could have happened, okay? But let's look at how the story was alleged to have happened. They allege that Michael Avenetti sat down with Mark Garagos across from lawyers and basically asked and extorted money in exchange for not releasing information. Okay? Now, if that is the case, I'll come on here and I'll eat crow, but you would have to be pretty stupid to try and extort a company in the presence of other lawyers. Okay? So I don't see it happening that way, especially with a lawyer like Mark Garagos with you. So the way I would see it is they were trying to negotiate a settlement, saying, look, we believe we have grounds for a lawsuit based on X, and we want to settle, and this is the number we want to settle the situation. Now, Nike is not happy having this information released, 
Okay, potentially. Yeah, it looks bad for Nike still. Yeah, exactly. So I would say that, you know, they didn't take it. They didn't like they didn't take too kindly to having another entity saying, you know, we're going to sue you. But uh, it's a tactic that lawyers can use. And this is this is all lawyer shit. Okay, I don't believe that Evanetti is going to be charged or that it's going to go anywhere. In my opinion, I believe it's going to actually come out that they tried to, you know, negotiate a settlement right then and there with the lawyers in exchange for maybe information not coming out, in exchange for, uh, you know, whatever Nike did to go away because it hurts some people that are with Adidas and things like that. So let it play out. But here's what's happening now. Online, when you go to see Mark Garagos uh, posting on Twitter, people are already assuming he's guilty. Okay, look, guys, this guy's 62 years old. This guy is a top lawyer. Yeah, he's defended scummy people. Yeah, he sued a lot of people. He's made a lot of money. But in the end, he's just another lawyer. And lawyers are mostly are, you know, they tend to be scummy. They're the reason why a lot of people are not happy with the system because they sue everybody. And I do think that this situation could result in Evanetti and Garrigo suing everybody, suing the Wall Street Journal. But Vito, to broaden it out, to talk about the media, I want you to pay attention to this case because it's going to probably dictate how the media goes about their business in the future. The Washington Post is being sued for $250 million by that kid in the Native American video, okay? He is saying that, you know, the rush to judgment, the information that was presented by the Washington Post was so bad and egregious that it's going to cause him future harm, that anybody could have found the whole video where he was not instigating this man, that the man kind of approached him, and he just stood there. So he's now he's not only suing the Washington Post, he's suing everybody. And he's suing not for a little money. And it's going to affect the media if this case gets settled. Because the media has to do a better job, in my opinion, and it will take the conversation this way, of when they frame something in a way that, that is trying to lead people to formulate an opinion, you better be factual. You better be okay. Because you can't go out there and call for uh, this kid to be, you know, admonished and yelled at and be judged for this video. Because you framed it in that way. You can't do that. That's libel. You, you get in trouble for that. So CNN, in my opinion, and other outlets, including Fox News, what they do is in their business, in all media, is they formulate a narrative and then they present information, which is sometimes factually correct. More factually correct on CNN than Fox yeah. News. Go on. That supports the argument. And all news networks do it. And sometimes we do it here. Uh, and we've done I, it here. Oh, yeah. I, I, I do it openly. It, right? We do it. You do it on Twitter to rile oh, up yeah. the masses and get oh, the yeah. following to be engaged. Right. But, you know, in terms of factual information, I think the media now is taking another hit because of the fact that the problem is people are realizing the media has an agenda. And my agenda is clear. I hate Michigan. That's my agenda. <laughs> yeah, we all know that. Loud okay. and clear. Okay. No, all kidding aside, I just want to give back to Michigan what they put out there in terms of their support. <laughs> just right back at them. Because uh -huh. I, I didn't learn. Uh, I'm not that way. How did I learn this? I learned it by watching you. Michigan fans, I learned it by watching you guys. So uh, basically, I'm just giving back to you what you give to us. Now you know my secret. But in the end, it's all fun and games. It's sports. But in the media world, in the news world, you have to... Go back. We have to go backwards. We have to slow this train down because what's happening now is, like you said, you're just spitting out talking points. Oh, he's not exonerated. Look, the report came out, and in essence, we can sit here and start with this point, that we both know that currently, under what was investigated, the president did not align himself with a foreign country to influence an election. Now, this country may have done those things through Facebook and other measures, but the president did not do those things. Now, the media that were not happy with Donald Trump spent a couple years talking about this issue at nauseum. Okay, Michael Avenetti, this guy charged now with extortion, was allowed to go on the airwaves and say whatever he wanted, you know, 75 times, you know, but other people are not allowed to go on that airwaves and speak and say, well, eh, let's not look at it that way. So I know some, some networks claim to be fair and balanced, but they're not. They all have agendas. They all are trying to, you know, be looked at like they're fair and balanced, but they don't. We need a new news network that actually is fair and balanced and really just, you know, a show called Just the Facts. Here's the facts. But guess what? Here's what happened. That you, you, still wouldn't be believed. Because you know what? How dirty of a reputation media has nowadays? Bad. And also because of the guy in the White House, because he calls everything fake news yeah. that is against him. So it can be factual. 
Typically is. Guess what? You know, he calls anything, this. but he calls anything fake news. But it's, this is true. It's not this fake. is a fact too. Yeah. Really quick, he calls anything fake news that he doesn't like. Yeah, it's it's biased news. So uh, now, who biased, are we gonna biased. believe? We wouldn't even believe that show. Mm-hmm. We have people nowadays, Doc, that will not believe anything the media yeah. says. Nothing that the media says is good enough for people. And I agree with that. But how bad is that? I agree with you that. You got to trust somebody in life too. I agree with as, that. As with anything, I think you got to trust somebody in life. Why is everybody so worried about every single thing not being factual when you have these hardworking, every single thing, though, every mm-hmm. single thing, when you have these hardworking journalists, even locally, on local news stations, like, they can't even trust now these Channel 7 news anchors and reporters, okay, Channel 4, Channel 2, I have, I have and a, these people can't trust anybody. I, you got to trust somebody in your life yeah. at some point or another. But I think what people are realizing is you got to think critically, and what has to sure, happen Sure, critically is, think, and then you can trust people. That's on these people that are consumers yeah. of the media. How about you guys critically think? The media is doing it for you, so if you want to actually realize whether or not the media is you know, delivering a factual narrative, well, how about... You do some research yourself, then you can actually critically think effectively, and then you'll know if the media is telling the truth. Why can't these consumers of the media, of the news, actually do that themselves, too? See, Vito, the idea is this, is that some networks have an agenda to paint— More than others, which is true, yeah. To paint the president as a bad guy, okay? Now, look for me. I have no opinion on the president because I don't follow it anymore. Yeah, you don't care, and there's I don't care. others out there like you that don't care. Yes. I, I actually just want to know what has the president done that has helped, and he seems to have spurred the economy a little bit. Things seem to be on the up and up. Now, is he a good guy? Well, that's for you to decide. I don't no, know he does crooks. His cronies are crooks. For sure he's not a good guy. He's a con man. Go on. Allegedly, that's, true. that's your opinion. Yeah. Formulated but, on media that is not almost real. Almost if you believe the other side, you're almost a fool. I think you're being duped. If you don't believe that that president— is a con man. I'm not saying he's a crook himself, but he deals with crooks. He associates with crooks. When a president, the president of the biggest nation, most important nation in the world, deals with crooks, how bad does it make it look for the president and for the nation collectively? Still makes it, so you can have your politics and say the economy is doing well, but I'm saying when you can legitimately say the president, which is true, has dealt with crooks, guys that have been indicted, that have helped him out with his campaign, isn't that a bad look? That's all I'm trying to say. Hey. Now, you can spin it any way that you want now when you bring up the politics and the economy, mm-hmm. but there is that side to the argument all day long, 365 days a year. But, Vito, I can say this. Most people associate with people <laughs> that— really, but No, no, no. You're saying most people associate with— But well, go on. I'll let you finish your statement first because— Listen, Vito, yeah. the, pre- the president's job is not to investigate and realize— He didn't know, but like Paul Manafort— He didn't know. How you know, made up, this guy was already in trouble before, though. Of course. So they're like, yes, I mean, he knew. Listen, no, come on. He's going to be the president. Listen, I have a, you better know. I heard this how about statement. vetting? How about vetting? Didn't you talk about the media vetting? How about the president vetting? You know, if I, the media's going to do it, how about our president do it? I'm going to deliver a line that I think I just heard uh, three hours ago. I think it was on a show, okay? If the police tail anybody for 500 miles and follow them, they're getting a ticket. Okay? I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Okay, so if you want to investigate anybody... For any length of time. Yeah, for two years. So that means Donald Trump, not that he's guilty of anything, but he's associated. Anybody, that means he anybody, was associated any, anybody, right, a, anybody. with guilty dudes. Anybody. Yeah. And so th- that game is, uh, you know, way, way above where we're at. In terms yes, of the, above our pay grade to analyze know, it. Yes. Yeah, the, the financial, political world of what people try and do to get by. Yeah. You know, that's crazy. That's a different but, world in itself, really. But for to get back to media and information, uh-huh. I do think that... Uh, it, it should change. I think it will change as a result of this in regards to Avenetti and how people view stories because what happens is people like hear information, they formulate their judgment, and we move on. And we never go back and fully investigate what we were all riled up about. And I just think that uh, for me, I've you know taken the stance of kind of avoiding the media. I don't watch too much. I watch a couple shows here and there. Uh, I do watch Don Lemon's show, and I do watch uh, Tucker Carlson on Fox. I watch a little bit of both. And uh, I formulate opinions. And uh, for me... I look at the media and I say that the bias has to be removed and they got to do a better job of not so clearly having an agenda. And it, it just it, it has to get back to, you know, real time journalism that you guys all studied and, you know, not looking at it from a ratings perspective. And that's why I think people are aware of it now, too, is the media is a business, you know, that you have to have eyes watching. And so what's going to sell more, uh, you know, telling the left that the president sucks and the right saying the president's the best thing on earth? You know, and you got to realize, okay, I think what people are realizing, and Sean Hannity came out and said it too. He's not a journalist. 
He's an entertainer. He's a guy that, He's an opinionist. He's a opinionist. This is the thing, Doc, too. You and I and everybody out there that is consuming the news yeah. from these media members, well, we have to realize these guys like Tucker Carlson are opinionists. Right. We can't else. just trust what they're saying as fact. We can't Everywhere. view it as that. Everywhere. That's the thing. We'd be better off as a nation, collectively, so if, if we knew and realized so that guys like Tucker Carlson, are, they're if, opinionists. If Carlson st- is an opinionist. If we were to start over, yeah. should... You know, in in light of the fact that probably old time journalism is boring, should we start over with old time journalism where just the facts, here's what we know now, take it for what it is, these are the facts. Because it won't draw ratings, it won't be sexy to kind of give the the GDP report every day and have an interview uh, with people that are in the know. It's more sexy and stylish to have people just ranting and raving and screaming all over the place and, and hurling these allegations in a slanted way. So... Can journalism survive in a modern way uh, without being slanted and biased in trying to get attention? I mean, look, Nolan Finley just, like we talked about, came out and gave this super strong opinion that a lot of people are talking about. But he was allowed to do an editorial, too. Yeah. Once again, he's a columnist. Columnists are allowed to express their opinions right. and viewpoints. So people have to realize that. It's almost like Tucker Carlson, Don Lemon to an extent as well on CNN. Those guys are giving their editorials, right? They are columnists on air giving their viewpoints on issues on the daily, Monday through Friday at least. So as consumers of the media, we have to realize that. And once we're better able to conceptualize that as a nation, Doc, then I think we'll be better off as a nation collectively. And I think you do have these traditional news men who are traditional hardcore journalists, such as David Muir. How about World News Tonight on Channel 7 on ABC? That is hard-hitting journalism. He is delivering the facts from that given day. That is what he is giving to you in his new uh, newscast as host of World News Tonight. Okay? He is conveying the facts. He is not there to spin it any way. He is there just to deliver the hard facts about every single story of the day. And then Lester Holt for NBC. Those guys for the nightly news, Monday through Friday. Those guys are traditional news anchor men. So Channel that 7 are actually just and delivering Holt. the news. Yes, those guys aren't opinionists that are trying to spin the news in their favor uh, and have an agenda and are trying to promote and support the president or go against him in his ways. Those guys aren't that. Now, if you go to Fox News especially, it's all about the right, all about Trump, and they will blow him all day long and support him and all of his policies. Then CNN has a liberal slant. But when you watch the evening news on Seven on four. I think you're getting more of the hard hitting journalism that people are used to from Walter Cronkite, David Meir, Lester Holt. Those are the modern day Walter Cronkites, the guys that are just delivering the news, are straight newsmen, and they're not spinning the news in any fashion whatsoever. And look, earlier in the week in relation to sports, uh, it hit you know the Detroit sports scene where there was a report that uh, Matt Patricia spoke to Adam Gase about potentially trading uh, for Matthew Stafford. Well, now like a couple hours after that came out, a report came out and said it never happened. So that's the tough part about news is that people are trying to put out information and they're using sources. And when and you're then, doing it quickly too, you can get then, it wrong. And then an hour later, it's like, well, it never happened. Something's disproving it. Yeah, so you report <laughs> something that it's gone against, yeah. right? It's just distanced. The report's distanced and, and disproved. And before we Real get quick. out, of, and before we get out of here to end this podcast, the hardest part is people are now parsing words to the point where they're debating like sentences and like saying how this you is say not fact. it. Right? You almost have to be even more careful than back it's in the day, crazy. right? With how you state things, because if you say it the wrong way, crazy. you get slammed too it's and blasted like, forever on Twitter and on social media. Doc. To give an example, it's like okay, Doc and Jock do a podcast every Thursday. And they're like, well, not really. You know, they do Thursday sometimes. It comes out on Wednesday at 12.58. Or some people will be like, no, uh, I've seen some podcasts that drop on Wednesday at 11.59 p.m. So, so there's a technicality. When you have a so, built-in technicality that people can go so, to, yeah, they can use so, it against you. And then I'll say, well, yeah, but it's it, it's released on Thursday and I promote it on Thursday. Well, no, you've seen some tweets at 11.45 that kind of talked about it. So does the show really air on Thursday? Yes, it airs on Thursday, asshole. But that's where people are parsing it down to that level of information and it's hard because some people are looking at facts that are facts and are parsing it and saying well if it didn't happen every single time it's like uh facts are facts there is no such thing as alternative facts exactly kellyanne conway came up with that herself there is no such thing a fact is a fact will always be a fact too and you know what's a fact Vito? 
This is the best podcast that airs on the weekend. Absolutely, anywhere. baby. Two bad hombres. Um, I'm wondering, you know, by the time this drops, I'm going to play a little bit of the the Powerball, maybe 20 bucks. You going to drop any money on it? Uh, I can't. Wednesday's drawing. It would happen on Wednesday. So if this doesn't air, then you'll realize I hit the Powerball, baby. Yeah, that he's gone for good. All the equipment's <laughs> been sold, too, from the studio in Sterling Heights. For Vito Chirco, I am the doc. Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to thank everybody for supporting the network, all the great sponsors. Check them out at DetroitSportsPodcast.com. You can follow the show at Two Bad Hombres. Follow Vito at Vito Jerome. And uh, definitely, if you've agreed or disagreed with anything that we've said today, follow the network at Detroit Podcast. Feel free. Like I said, you know, if you trust us, I appreciate it. If you don't trust us, let us know what, how we can do better. That's what we're always striving for. Thank you, DC Sports. Thank you, Legacy Football. Adios. Have a good weekend, everybody.